Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Money, Real Business podcast. We record these interviews so potential buyers can learn more about the business and the seller to help them make a buying decision. Now, all of the business details, which include the type of business it is, how much revenue and profit it makes, and all of the assets included in the sale can be found on the business listing. To view this information, you can visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace and search for this business listing number, which is listed in the video thumbnail and the description. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. And if after listening, you want to take an even deeper dive into the business to perform your due diligence before potentially purchasing this business, you can unlock this listing to look through all of the business information, which includes the domain, the products, the P&L, and more. So can you tell us a little about your background in building and running online businesses? First off, thank you for your interest in our company. As a little background about us as founders, we started selling on Amazon and kind of dealing with the e-commerce FBA space back in 2016, so going on seven to eight years now. We started off, as a lot of people have, you know, with the Jungle Scout analysis, garlic presses, and the whole deal. And I think after a couple of years of you know, trying different product niches, different products, figuring out logistics and how everything works. We did spot a market niche for this particular product. We were personally excited about the category because we were using alternatives, but didn't quite have the perfect product that would meet our specific needs. And then we became basically interested in sourcing this and launching it as a private label. First, we also sourced similar replacement products from large companies and basically became distributors, bundling them together, which helped us once again develop a more intimate knowledge of what goes into the product, how customers receive it, what potential issues are with it, all the customer you know, problems and inquiries. And based off of that, we were able to create a really good business plan and kind of a pathway for us to really source the best possible product and launch it and present it to the customers that would hit a lot of the check marks that I think we're missing in the market. We spent a lot of time, I think one to two years, trying to find the perfect factory. There are not a lot of factories in the world from our understanding that actually manufacture this product. So barrier to entry is fairly high. In terms of the product itself, we have been selling it for about four years now. It comes with essentially a three SKU lineup with one SKU being the main product and two other complementary products that come with it. Essentially, if you want to think about it as a printer to cartridge model, so you would buy the printer first that comes with maybe a little sample of color and black and white cartridges. And after printing a few pages, you run out and then you're essentially forced to reorder the ink on an ongoing basis, which is a higher margin product. So our business model essentially works on a similar trajectory. You have one SKU as the main hero product and then two SKUs as complementary products that you would order on a reoccurring basis as you you use the product over time. The reason we think our business is very attractive in the FBA space and e-commerce in general is we do have a recurring piece that I just described. Essentially, you have the printer and ink model. So with that comes a very high barrier to entry because you essentially are forced to sell the actual hero main product at cost or close to it, especially with it being now more or less an established market niche on Amazon and just in general online space. So for any new competitor, for example, to enter this niche, they would essentially have to sell the hero product at cost or below cost for probably a year or two before they accumulate enough sales to kind of get margin on the back end from the recurring revenue. So 
part of that is not a lot of people have the capital wherewithal and the patience to do something like this and stick it out. So we have seen a lot of entries of new competitors come in and drop out fairly quickly. And we've kept our kind of established position as the top three offering organically in the space for multiple years now in a row. In terms of logistics, once again, we learned from our previous kind of ventures and mistakes. And from a summary perspective, this is a very good product. Logistics are very streamlined. We have a 21-day lead time, so about three weeks. Shipping is air freight, so it's very quick, three to five days. You will have the product stateside and you know, up to you where you want to ship it to a 3PL warehouse directly to Amazon. So you can save a few days here and there. But overall, the cash cycle is very quick and we're usually able to get the product from point of order to Amazon checked in and for sale within 30 days. This helps cash flow management as obviously you're getting payouts a lot quicker than, for example, if you are using a model that uses ocean freight where, you know, your products are in the water for 30 to 45 plus days here. Shipping is not really a concern. And furthermore, over the past three, four years, we've never really experienced logistics issues that are common with sea freight, such as, you know, the issues with bottlenecks in the different canals, different ports and stuff like that. So air freight has been very smooth before COVID, throughout COVID and after COVID. So that's another, I think, really good selling point to this product and business. So why are you selling the business now instead of keeping it and growing it further? The business is currently at a point where it runs basically on autopilot. Most of the day-to-day tasks are handled by our VA, who has been with the company for, I think, over three years and is very independent and knowledgeable about all aspects of the business, customer service, how the product works, and anything else imaginable. While we do think there are multiple paths that can be taken to grow the business further, As founders, we also have some personal interests that we want to pursue. So, for example, I myself have been in the past two years involved in developing and building a kiteboarding resort in Mexico, where I currently live. And this would be kind of the first year we are really open and are driving some marketing towards getting people down here, getting some influencers, getting some, you know, semi-pro kiteboarders. So that's been taken up more and more of my time. So as part of that transition, it wouldn't be the worst time to pass the business off to another person who would be able to dedicate their entire time to looking after it and growing it. My business partner is also on the same page as for the past two years. He's been essentially hands off the day-to-day operations and focusing full-time on launching a startup, which had a 50 million valuation. So obviously for him as well, other priorities have crept up. Finally, both of us are living outside of US and kind of locally seeing how real estate markets are developing. We personally see a lot of opportunity in real estate investments here locally where we live. However, All the real estate investments essentially outside of U.S. here are 100% cash up front. So part of the proceeds, we would also like to deploy and invest into some real estate assets. That would be part of the motivation for the sale. And I think the other one, the big one, is for somebody to really dedicate the time to move this business forward versus juggling multiple potential interests at the same time. Can you describe the amount and the type of work that you do on this business to maintain it? As mentioned before, for the most part, the business is running on autopilot. Over the years, it took us a fair amount of time to set up all the markets. But I think at this point, it is very well set on autopilot with our VA handling most of the day-to-day tasks. As I mentioned before, we have two partners in the business. One partner is completely hands-off at this point, running another venture that is not Amazon FBA affiliated. So he's essentially exited the space for the past two plus years. I've been handling kind of the day-to-day tasks along with any sort of business development to give you a quick breakdown of, let's say of like a, what a typical week would look like. I would say 
you could you know allocate maybe eight to ten hours um, some less some more obviously you can never predict exactly the amount but to give you an idea of the type of tasks that would need to be performed outside of the va scope would be let's say one hour spent on communicating with suppliers and placing orders one hour dealing with any sort of escalations from the va she has standard operating procedures in place with a certain threshold. So for example, if somebody wants to return something that's over $50, then maybe she'll reach out to us to make sure it's okay versus anything under 50. She just has the green light to handle herself. If there are any customer inquiries that she's not sure how to respond to or hasn't seen before, you know, we can kind of go through that together with her and she will add it as a new kind of set of question answer to her standard operating procedure. And hopefully in the future, she handles it herself. So that's kind of the idea there. Probably about two hours a week are spent on reviewing the business in general. And by that, I mean, you kind of get a eagle's eye view of, you know, the reviews, the markets, the trends on pricing, what your competitors are doing, are your margins okay, is your PPC running optimally, is any ROAS or ACAS kind of running high. So essentially take some time to do a quick overview of the business and see if you notice anything that needs to be either increased, decreased, pull back, or if you need to pay attention to anything that kind of looks out of place. One hour, I would say, would be spent on reviewing return statistics, voice of the customer, any other metrics that essentially are on the account level. So, for example, like an inventory score, just to make sure that you're meeting all of Amazon's you know, very particular requirements. Because if you don't look at something, it will accumulate and then Amazon potentially can take action. So we, over time, have learned to be very proactive and kind of do a review ourselves to essentially be very aware of everything that goes on with the account. One hour would be spent on reviewing, I think I mentioned before, but PPC campaigns, and we outsource the US portion to a PPC company to run. So I would do a quick review of their performance. And then also you would have a monthly catch-up call to review monthly performance, or you know if you need to amend something, you see anything off, you would jump on a call or send them an email. So, you know, you can budget about an hour a week for that. I would say one hour is spent on, if you could call it business development or just, you know, reviewing all sorts of communications that come from Amazon or from 3PL companies in the Amazon FBA space. So, for example, you know, if Amazon's introducing new fees, you need to get adjusted to any sort of new regulations you need to follow. Basically, any sort of updates that are related to FBA that might impact the business that you kind of need to be aware of and potentially act on. I would say two hours a week, and that's personal preference. I just like to keep a close eye on the business financials in general, but I will do a essentially an updated balance sheet, make sure all the bills are paid. We have terms with our suppliers, so I keep a tracker to make sure everybody's paid up. I review all the inventory levels, do some forecasting to make sure we're not running low on any stock. If we are running low, submit tickets to send in more inventory. So basically a couple hours a week just to make sure there are no gaps once again in the business and all the financials look okay and in good shape. And finally, I would say one hour or less because it's mostly a monthly event, but for the EU part of the business, there is a requirement to essentially file a monthly VAT reimbursement report. And usually it's a process that takes less than an hour, but you know you can budget, let's say, an hour per week just in case it takes you longer or eventually that will decrease in the amount of time it takes you to finalize that task particularly. And I think that would be it in terms of time commitment and the tasks that are performed by me personally. And I would say the rest is handled by our VA. Now, if you were to keep the business, what are some ways you would try to grow it? Some of the ways to keep growing the business, one would be increasing the lifetime value of the customers. As mentioned previously, profits are driven by repeat purchases product does offer additional functionality as an option. So that could be used in order to drive the increase in that lifetime value. So for example, adding Bluetooth functionality 
to the products, enabling it, creating an app around it, would give you a direct line of access to your customer's personal phone at any time through which you can kind of ping them for more product sales, more information, or whatever it might be. Diversifying the revenue would be another aspect. You could look at increasing the recurring revenue from existing customers on other sales channels, such as the website. We do have an established mailing list that we have not utilized. So you could look at retargeting some of those existing customers outside of Amazon through email marketing campaigns such as that. Or you could also look at optimizing some of the other channels that we haven't really closely paid attention to, such as Walmart. You could look at community and social media outreach programs in order to increase revenue and just brand presence. We are not experts in social media, so we never really explored those avenues to gain new customers or use those as potential sales channels. So, for example, I know there's a big drive using TikTok as a direct sales platform, which we did not utilize. Same with Facebook or Instagram. So for a buyer who has a team or who is really well versed with how to establish and manipulate social media sphere, I think there's plenty of opportunity there to gain additional customers and revenue. General product market expansion, I think, would be another really good way to grow the business. We are pretty established in U.S. We started selling in EU, but that's still in its very kind of initial stages. So a lot can be optimized there as well as introducing it to additional European markets. EU is also currently not actively managed in terms of the PPC ads. So there's another opportunity there to really uh, optimize and streamline uh, the advertising and potentially expose the product to a new audience and gain incremental sales. Outside of EU expansion, there's also an opportunity to look at other geographies as a source of additional revenue. So for example, either looking at Latin America or Asia, could be an option as well. Finally, I think the product, because it's in the health space, you could introduce other complementary products and basically launch them as an add-on to the current line. And you could use it to either target your existing clients or the new clients that you gain through the sale of the hero products who then get into your kind of ecosphere with either providing you their email or just making recurrent purchases. So once you have that connection established, you could think of other complementary products that you could launch into the space and then retarget those same customers. So essentially, once again, increasing the lifetime value of that customer. And what are the biggest risks with this business that a buyer should be aware of? Biggest risk associated with this business, I would say, are no different than any other FBA business. If anything, we are a little bit more insulated from the common risk factors associated with FBA. So, for example, additional competition is a big one where, you know, the products get flooded once they see a opportunity in the market. Prices go down, you end up with no margin and eventually exit the market. So with our product, it does have a high barrier to entry on a few different levels. So it's a little bit more protected. And as mentioned before, due to the business nature slash model where you're selling the hero product at costs or close to it, once again, it creates a high barrier to entry for new competitors because they would have to enter the market, sell for a year or two, essentially at a loss before they can start breaking even and turning it into positive. And with an FBA product cycle, everybody will not survive those one, two years before reaching profitability at this point. Another issue could be, for example, increasing of advertising PPC costs. We are, I think, a little bit more insulated than others. We restructured our PPC to where 70% of our sales are coming from organic sources with 30 being supplemented by ads. So I think if there is some sort of a negative impact on PPC costs, once again, with a 70-30 breakdown, you wouldn't be impacted as much and the risk would be mitigated. 
Finally, Amazon suspensions, delistings, the typical fear of any FBA owner is always present. I think with our product at this point, it's very minimal just because it's been around for four years. It's very well established. There have been categories set up on the back end that tailor this product a little bit better than before. Amazon's a little bit more familiar with the sort of documentation that it requires. We have all the documentation on hand. So whenever any issues do come up, we provide them very quickly. We haven't had any long-term issues with the product or the account. We did have one delisting, I believe, at the end of 2022, which lasted a few days. It was just a request for additional documentation, which we provided and were reinstated. So something like that is always out there as a risk, but we're confident that we keep all the documentation on hand up to date. So if it does come up, you know, shouldn't be an issue for us or for you as a buyer. And how much support are you willing to offer a buyer who acquires this business? I think our main interest in obviously is a successful sale, first of all, but a close second would be actually seeing this business uh, succeed out past us and survive us and grow. We have contributed a fair amount of our you know, time, efforts over the years to grow it to the point that it is now. So I think we could easily start at you know, 60 days of email or phone support. And then you know, if something else is needed beyond that, we can discuss that as well. But once again, I think this is very negotiable from our end. Our goals are very much aligned with any potential buyers where we are interested in seeing this business succeed long term, not just pass it off and wash our hands of it. And regarding the sale of this business, just confirming you commit to a non-compete? In terms of a non-compete, I can confirm that both myself and my business partner have no issues signing the non-compete and honoring it after the sale. And are you open to negotiating something like an earnout? In terms of an earnout, as I mentioned before, part of the proceeds would be immediate cash needs. So our ideal scenario would be a primarily cash up front after a short transition period. And then in order to free up that capital, if there is an earn out piece that needs to be implemented as part of the sale, then from our end, we would like to minimize it as much as possible. Now, putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer, why do you think this is a business worth buying? Well, I think this is not your typical Amazon FBA business and is a little bit more stable and protected. We do have high barriers to entry. We have been in the market for four years now, I believe. So it's a fairly established niche. And we have not really seen new competition penetrate this specific kind of area and heavily impact our sales. We do have a healthy recurring revenue piece where you are receiving a lot of the margin from the sales. Our logistics with air freight shipping have been very smooth with no interruptions for the past four years. Pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, doesn't matter what's kind of going on with the sea freight. We have not had any issues keeping our product in stock and manufactured. Part of the air shipping is also the short cash conversion cycle. So you actually get your cash out of the business fairly quickly versus having to wait for months and months and months between the you know sea shipping, selling the product, getting your money out, and then potentially placing a subsequent order that eats away all the money you just made. Here, because of such a short cash conversion cycle, you are able to pull money out on an ongoing basis. I think our customers are pretty passionate and because of the recurring revenue piece, they do keep using the product over and over. And as outlined in the previous answers, I think there is ample opportunity for growth, kind of depending on a buyer's individual strengths and maybe they have experience in a sphere of e-commerce that we, for example, did not have our strength in. So, for example, whether that be social media, whether that be more of a app-based outreach or an email campaign, those are all things that could be explored for additional revenue, which we haven't really targeted ourselves. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. To learn more and see if this listing is still for sale, head over to empireflippers.com slash marketplace and search for this business listing number, which is listed in the video thumbnail and the description. And if you're watching this on YouTube, click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. And once you've unlocked this listing, you'll be given everything you need to know about this business. So thanks for joining us. And until next time.